better? Nice. Yes. Okay. Let me start again. The realization, uh, I want to thank her. <laughs> the realization that what is real is not what I'd always taken it to be, and that our notion of objectivity is effectively social, blew my mind upon first reading Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman's The Social Construction of Reality as a senior in 1971. The mechanisms, the mechanism most responsible for how we come to collectively view something as objective, I found out, was the process of reification. As I've been telling my students for nearly 40 years, if I had to choose only five sociology books to take with me to a desert island, <laughs> social construction of reality, a delightful soup-like blend of Marx, Durkheim, Weber, Mead, Mannheim, and Schultz, would definitely be one of them. And the way it introduces the phenomenon of verification would be the main reason for that. An idea that goes back to Marx's discussion of commodity fetishism. Verification was first examined explicitly by Lukács, who called it phantom objectivity. Yet the credit for fleshing out its socio-phenomenological implications definitely goes to Berger and Lachmann. As I shall demonstrate here, the discussion of verification provides the hitherto missing social dimension of the epistemic policy commonly known as essentialism by highlighting the manner in which we come to experience the merely conventional as inevitable. I first realized that while I was writing my 1977 article, The French Republican Calendar, in which I examined the French attempt to reform our standard time measurement and time reckoning system in the 1790s. Not only did that experiment expose the merely conventional nature of the way we measure and reckon time, it also exemplified how the equally conventional system used to replace it was nevertheless presented by the reformers as objective. I further explored that theme in my 1985 book, The Seven Day Circle, in which I tried to highlight the way we provide the utterly conventional seven day rhythm in accordance with which we organize so much of our everyday lives with an aura of inevitability. I even titled the section that concludes the book, Reification. The phenomenon of reification is also central to my discussion in the fine line of the seemingly inevitable status we attribute to the ultimately imaginary boundaries that help us delineate conceptual categories and thereby classify things, as well as to my more recent examination in Ancestors and Relatives of the social foundations of our notions of genealogical relatedness. Furthermore, in my forthcoming book, Hidden in Plain Sight, which I've dedicated to Peter Berger, I question the seemingly inevitable background-like status attributed by the Gestalt theories of perception to what we only conventionally come to perceive as empty spaces rather than figure-like things. And as I'm currently writing a book about the unmarked parts of social reality, I can report to you that challenging the seemingly inevitable nature of unmarkedness is at the center of that project as well. At the heart of the process of reification is the sociomental act of making the merely conventional appear as it were inevitable. In other words, it is the act of making the merely intersubjective seem objective. As I shall now demonstrate, that involves the use of one or more of what I call the five pillars of essentialism, namely religion, as often manifested in the idea of God, science, as typically manifested in the idea of nature, logic, as typically manifested in the notion of reason, universalism, as typically manifested in the notions of everybody and everywhere, and eternalism, as typically manifested in the notion of always. The prototypical organized system of legitimation, to use Berger and Lachmann's terminology, is religion, often encapsulated in the idea of God, an omnipotent entity supposedly shaping reality. In numerous societies around the world, one encounters various manifestations of such an entity, whether in its polytheistic or monotheistic forms. Yet it is monotheism that provides the clearest manifestation of how it is reified as exemplified by the way the very word is spelled in English. In marked contrast to a mere non-capitalized river or rain god, with small g, a capitalized god has an aura of inevitability. Religion, as Berger and Lachmann point out, 
can account for any social arrangement one encounters. And as Berger kept emphasizing in the sacred canopy, it does not itself require any further legitimation because it is regarded as axiomatic. Invoking God, the prophet Jeremiah could thus tell his fellow ancient Israelites that God, who evidently could not even save his own temple in Jerusalem from the Babylonians' wrath, in fact brought about that destruction himself in order to punish their idolatry. The same sort of claim was also used by the Reverend Jerry Falwell in 2001 when he presented the 9-11 attacks on the U.S. as God's retribution for the sinful actions of abortionists, feminists, and gays and lesbians. Such reasoning has likewise led some Orthodox Jews to attribute divine authorship to the Holocaust. American slave owners and South African apartheid supporters who claim that God condones slavery and racial segregation, and Boko Haram and ISIS to associate their current murderous campaigns in Nigeria and Iraq with God's name. In order to not only construct, but also maintain a religiously legitimated social reality, its architects also produce the very tools they somewhat cynically then use as evidence of its absolute validity. I'm referring, of course, to the scriptures, also capitalized, those allegedly divine texts used to legitimate the, that very system of legitimation. Their supposedly objective status is critical for such legitimation. And even Jews, Christians, or Muslims who question the divine origin attributed by Mormons to the relatively recent golden tablets which they believe Joseph, Joseph Smith translated into the Book of Mormon, rarely use the same spirit of skepticism with regard to the divine and therefore seemingly objective origin which they themselves attribute to the Bible, the Gospels, and the Quran. The epistemic authority of religion seems unbeatable as God in the scriptures and any discussion, as anyone who has ever discussed the age of the universe with a creationist very well knows. I myself have experienced it in the form of fundamentalist critique of my seven-day circle which implies my naivete at not realizing that the origin of our seven-day week was God's rest on the seventh day, following the six days of the creation, as documented in Genesis. <laughs> From that standpoint, of course, arguing that the people who introduce a seven-day rhythm are then likely to also construct a cosmogony featuring the creation of the universe in six days following, followed by a seven-day divine rest, rather than the other way around, indeed sounds naive. During the 16th and 17th centuries, however, as part of the scientific revolution, God's inevitability suffered a serious blow with the rise of nature as the beacon of early modernist essentialism. As physicists and biologists have ever since then been trying to convince us, it is science, usually encapsulated in the form of nature, that now accounts for everything and ends any discussion about facticity and essence. Instead of the scriptures, it is a notion of scientific evidence that now wins such debates. And so elegantly exemplified by the French Republican reformers' decisions to name their new months after seasonal phenomena and tie the beginning of their new annual cycle to the autumnal equinox, naturalizing conventional social arrangements now often replaces the traditional tactic of invoking God. And as chronobiologist Franz Halberg implied in his review of the seven-day circle, I, evident, I evidently failed to realize why it is biology rather than sociology that provides the best account for why billions of people today organize their everyday lives in accordance with the seven-day rhythm. If only the Aztecs and the Baha'is with their 13 and 19-day religious cycles and the West Africans and ancient Romans with the four and eight-day market cycles had also read Halberg and realized that upon deciding, upon, upon deciding how to temporarily organize their lives. And as I later find, found out upon examining the logic of how we reckon genealogical relatedness, we try to provide even utterly unnatural social arrangements, such as the so-called one rule, rule, with an aura of inevitability, thereby viewing Barack Obama as an essentially black man with a white mother rather than as an essentially white man with a black father. And it was Johann Gottfried von Herder's association of peoplehood with a pronouncedly organicist image of what he called a community of blood 
that has helped naturalize the modern ethnomation so that with the Aryanization of Nazi Germany, as one eugenics enthusiast put it in 1936, I quote, the word nation no longer meant a number of citizens living within certain boundaries, but a biological, that is natural, entity. Nature functions just like God, as when evolutionists replace the biblical narrative of the creation with an equally axiomatic acceptance of Darwin's idea of monophyly. And as one might expect, the social order comes to have an aura of a natural order, as reifiers mistake what Durkheim called social facticity with truly natural facticity, as manifested in how people implicitly invoke nature whenever they present phenomena such as racial integration, and feminism, and homosexuality as unnatural. Whereas science was the way in which the 16th and 17th century scientific revolution articulated the decline of religion as the traditional pillar of essentialism, logic, as manifested in the notion of reason, was the response of the 18th century enlightenment, which soon followed in its footsteps. Not only did the French Republican reformers name their new months after seasonal phenomena and tie the beginning of the new annual cycle to the autumnal equinox, they also tied their time measurement system to base 10, a foundational, a foundational pillar of the unmistakably rational queen of the sciences, mathematics, by introducing a 10-day week and dividing the day into 10 hours divided by 100 minutes, further divided into 100 seconds. Has anyone who has ever been asked by economists to assume that humans act rationally knows a pluralistic view of logic is a no-no in such a rationalist approach. The words logic and reason are both capitalized as if there is indeed only one way to be reasonable and act rationally or logically. As I learned while writing the fine line, this is quite evident with regard to the process of classification, whereby merely conventional ways of mentally organizing the world are nevertheless considered, as in IQ tests, the most logical way of doing so. More recently, while writing Hidden in Plain Sight, I realized that it is likewise quite evident with regard to the process of attention, as when we usually consider relevance simply a matter of logic and what we inattend or disattend intrinsically irrelevant or extraneous. And when reading experts write about teaching children how to identify what they call the main idea and distinguish key information from minor details in the text, one gets the impression that relevance is indeed objectively determinable. Yet other than in analytic philosophy and mathematics, it is rarely logic alone that delineates the scope of our attention and thereby determines what we, call, what we consider relevant, relevant. It is never simply logic, for instance, that compels jurors to ignore inadmissible evidence presented in court. Viewing anything as intrinsically relevant or irrelevant thus effectively essentializes the merely conventional way in which we actually attribute relevance. And though the distinctive manner in which people with autism typically focus their attention makes them appear, I'm, I'm quoting, appear to ignore relevant stimuli in favor of apparently meaningless ones, the decision which stimuli are relevant and which are meaningless is ultimately a conventional one. The fourth pillar of essentialism Effectively underlying the first three is universalism, as manifested in our notions of everybody and everywhere. Going back to Marx's discussion of false consciousness as a way of presenting the particular as universal, it basically boils down to the sociomental fallacy of mistaking the merely collective for the truly universal. As we know from Schutz's as well as Berger and Lachmann's analysis of intersubjectivity, just because something is not subjective does not necessarily imply that it must therefore be objective. A point also made by Durkheim, who demonstrated that when we examine cognition, sociology offers us something that neither empiricism nor rationalism can offer. And as I try to show in social mindscapes, rejecting the binary distinction between cognitive individualism and cognitive universalism is indispensable to the establishment of a cognitive sociology. The fact that we do not think only as individuals, I argue there, does not necessarily mean that we therefore think only as human beings. We also think as social beings, members of what Fleck so compellingly identified as particular thought communities. 
The essentializing power of universalism lies in its ability to convince us that people everywhere, that is all humans, act in a certain way. Drawing on some absolute vision of normality thus presents the merely conventional choices they make as inevitable. Along with universalism, one also sees the workings of the fifth pillar of essentialism, also underlying the first three, namely eternalism, as manifested in our notion of always, which is the historicized form of everybody. Eternalism basically boils down to the sociomental fallacy of mistaking the historically specific for the truly eternal. Not only does reification involve ignoring cross-cultural variability, it also involves ignoring change. As Schutz demonstrated in his highly evocative depiction of a child born to a couple of newly males stranded on an island, children view the historically specific social world with which they are confronted as if it had always been that way, despite the fact that much of that may actually be the result of changes that had taken place in it only recently. For American three-year-olds today, after all, the idea of a black president or a woman on the Supreme Court does not seem as strange as it would have seemed to most Americans only 40 years ago. In order to reify social reality, it therefore helps to establish that whatever one encounters today or remembers from some relatively recent past is actually the way it has always been. Thus, the 1992 Republican Convention, for example, as if reminding her audience how America used to be prior to the tumultuous 1960s, Marilyn Quayle, America's second lady, indeed presented the historically unique social scene of the 1950s as the way it had always been prior to the 60s. And if the 50s were part of a supposedly constant always, then the 60s and 70s evidently must have been an historic aberration. Using mental capital letters, as I pointed out earlier, helps three fires provide the intersubjective and thereby merely conventional with a semblance of objectivity and thus inevitability. During the 1984 presiden vice presidential debate, responding to Geraldine Ferraro's assertion that despite being a Catholic, she would honor American women's legal right to have an abortion, Vice President Bush stated that abortion is not a matter of religion, but of morality. Within the context of a political culture committed to the separation of church and state, religion, he thus implied, might very well not be capitalized, but morality, effectively spelled with a capital M, and thereby conveying moral clarity, would always remain immune to such epistemic pluralism. Such are the default assumptions we make and tacitly take for granted, and it is precisely the taken for grantedness a major Schutzian theme pursued by Bergen and Lachmann that a year later also came to play a critical role in how the Garfield was the methodology that gives those default assumptions the epistemic authority that generates assumed inevitability. Eighty-five years ago, while Alfred Schutz was working on the phenomenology of the social world, Antonio Gramsci was promoting in his prison notebooks the idea of cultural hegemony. The most fundamental element in such hegemony, I would argue, is cognitive hegemony, the product of having a particular way of seeing the world audaciously presented as the absolute, an inevitable way of doing so. Nothing helps establish such hegemony more than the act of convincing people to make certain taking for granted default assumptions without even realizing that they're making them. And as I'm currently writing a book about the phenomenon of unmarkedness, which is tacitly accomplished by semiotically marking some parts of social reality, yet leaving the rest of it taken for granted, I'm here to tell you that no one could embark on such a project without being heavily influenced and inspired by Peter Berger and Thomas Lachmann's masterful 50-year-old social construction of reality. Thanks. <laughs>